Thank you, Dan. Well, if there's any particular time of year where we ought to reflect in our lives more of Christ and less of us, it would be the, the Thanksgiving celebration. I trust you had a great time either being a witness to those that don't know Christ or just enjoying the honor of Jesus Christ and your family and your time together. As you know, uh, we have been looking at this subject of dying to self and having more of Christ exude from our life and a whole lot less of us, working our way through a list of principles that we've sort of taken um, as, a, as a group and, and really um, as a testimony to the heart and soul of what Jesus said to anyone who might say they want to follow him, and that is, if you want to come after Christ, if you want to go his path, if you want to walk with him, then you must deny yourself. You got to say no to yourself. You got to increasingly die to yourself because that's really what happened at conversion. When you were regenerate, when the Spirit of God convicted you of your sin and granted you faith and repentance, in that moment you saw Christ as your only Savior. In that sense, then all other saviors were nothing to you. Your own self, the world, whatever your religious notion was before that, if any. None of those would be rescuers for a life in eternity, if you even thought there was one that existed, all of them went by the wayside when you turned to Christ. He became your sole, exclusive hope. And in that sense, you died to self, died to self-atonement, died to self-righteousness. You died to self-preservation. In that moment, you died to self-indulgence. You died to self-exaltation. Because all of that is produced by the Spirit of God in conversion. And from that moment, you embark upon a life of following after Christ, which means that you take up your cross daily and you deny yourself and you obey him. That's that's what Jesus meant to say to them. That's what he was stating. And so we've been looking at some practical ways to do that. We've kind of gathered together a, a host of the, the, uh, the thread of commands in Scripture for the believer... And we've looked at them from the angle of how they help you kill self, how they help you die to yourself, and, and so that more of Christ can be evident in your life and in your heart, your mind, your desires, your motivations, your conduct. We've looked at the first five. Here they are. First of all, we, we've got to admit that we don't know what we need to know, so we've got to pray for spiritual understanding every day. That kills self-reliance. We looked at that. We orient our life. We discipline our life for the purpose of promoting godliness. So we orient it toward truth. That's the death of indulging yourself all the time. The death of self-indulgence is to orient your life toward truth. Thirdly, you, you allow that truth to correct. You allow it to change. You allow it to confront, to convict, to indict your life. And to shape your thinking and renew your mind, that'll, that'll help you die to the exaltation of self. Fourthly, uh, because we are prone to self-deception and, and we allow things into our life to, to tempt our vulnerabilities, uh, we've got to close up those vulnerabilities. We've got to close those avenues through which temptation makes us weaker. Portals, we called them. So number four was to permanently seal up sin's portals in order to die to self-deception. Last week was number five, was the death of self-interest. How do we die to self-interest? You've got to lose yourself in other people's needs. Consider others as more important than yourself, Philippians 2, 3. Consider other people's interests as more important than your own interests. And we, we looked... That's several practical ways to lose yourself in other people's burdens and needs and cares. Number six, and it's in the providence of God that it it comes on this week in my list that I originally made up. It's no surprise that the Lord would do this for us. Number six, cultivate thankfulness in your heart and in your life. Cultivate thankfulness in your heart and in your life. What does this kill? It kills self-preservation. 
Self-preservation. You say, why? Why does it kill self-preservation? Because you live in a fallen world, and to follow Christ means you're going to have a lot of things that you face for which humanity does not want to be thankful. A lot of things in life for which man might complain and grumble and sinfully live in a life of ingratitude. A few years ago, I read a little book called Respectable Sins. Maybe you've read it. Respectable Sins by Jerry Bridges. It's no surprise that in that book, he has a chapter called Unthankfulness. It's one of the respectable sins, or what he says is a a sin that we find acceptable. Yet, it is a sin, he says, that is no minor infraction. It is not acceptable. In fact, it's an affront and an insult to the one who created us and sustains us every second of our lives, the chapter says. Failing, Bridges says, to continually give God thanks is one of our acceptable sins, and far too many Christians wouldn't think of it as a sin, yet in Paul's description of a spirit-filled person, we are to give thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Ephesians 5.20. This may seem to be a benign sin to us because it doesn't harm anyone else. Speaking a bit later, Reflecting on Romans 1 and the original sin, Jerry Bridges says that the ever-increasing wickedness of the world began with their unthankfulness to God, end quote. Romans 1.21, although they knew God, they did not acknowledge him as God or give thanks. It is the original expression of pride. It basically says, You made me, you sustain me, you give me breath and life. In you I move and exist and have my being. Uh, You are creator, I'm dependent. You're self-existent, I'm not. But I don't care. I just don't care. And it's interesting that in Romans 1, it is a description of where that first sin leads in humanity, and it always leads the same place. It's always downhill, always moral degradation, always spinning off into further and further affrontery to God's design. You want to know why our society is beginning to destroy marriage and the family? You want to know why it's redefining everything? Because in the perverseness of the heart, it refuses to thank God for who he is, and therefore it refuses to thank him for anything that he's designed. And the way to defy God when you're not thankful to God is to confront God with his design by perverting it. That's why Romans 1 says that evil cultures, once they begin to to deny God and not be thankful to God, but live for themselves, it will always go toward moral degradation, always. Why is ingratitude so closely related to moral depravity? Because ingratitude is not an attitude issue, it is a belief issue, it's a faith issue. It's an unbelief problem. It's very simple if you think about it in your mind. God promises to rescue a repentant soul from eternal judgment. But a rebel does not believe in eternal judgment. So he doesn't find a compelling reason to thank God for his existence, let alone a redeemer. It's very simple. God promises to satisfy every need, but a rebel, an unbeliever, thinks that they already know their needs and that they themselves are the sole satisfier of their needs. So think about it. If everything comes from yourself, why express gratitude to anyone except yourself? God promises to be the strength and shield of all those who come to him. God promises to be the sole exclusive savior of all those who come to him. A rebel doesn't believe he has a darkened heart, so if a rebel doesn't believe he has a darkened heart, there's nothing to be saved from. He trusts in himself and therefore is ungrateful to a creator, if indeed there is a creator. I love the fact that scripture calls Christians believers. Believers. We're believers. 
It's, it's almost a synonym or should be a synonym for thankfulness. Shouldn't it? I'm a believer. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. The next thing that ought to come out of my mouth is I'm thankful. <laughs> because a believer has to be thankful because that's the opposite of the original sin which was the pride of ingratitude, the effrontery of self-righteousness and self-exaltation. Believers are thankful people because we're humbled people. We trust in the promises of God. We believe in the promises of God. And we know that every circumstance between now and the time we meet our great God, every circumstance, every part of life is part of his all-wise plan, this great God who has saved us. And it is a gracious plan, always a gracious plan. No matter what it includes, it's a gracious plan, kind, covering, forgiving, loving, merciful, So we are believers. Believers believe. And if they believe, then believers are thankful. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, you might take a moment and just look at this text. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, we've looked at it before, but there's a a wonderful expression in this text Not just the superlative where he says, in everything give thanks, but notice why you give thanks in everything. For this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. If he saved you in Christ Jesus, then it is his will. It's always his will that you always give thanks in everything. Now, in order to give thanks in everything, you're going to have to have a basis. You're going to have to have some roots to this. You can't just imagine that thankfulness is a surface practice. Okay, you know, I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful I didn't have that happen or this or this. That, that's true. Out on the outer edges, there is thankful word and thankful deed and thankful conduct expressed. But that isn't where it comes from. It's got to come from deep into the root system. And in order to have a life of thankfulness or a heart of thankfulness cultivated, it is rooted in what we believe. You can, you can want to be thankful, but if you don't know why you're thankful, if you're not rooted in theology, you're going to have trouble getting any further than superficial surface thankfulness. What is the, what is the root system? What's the theological groundwork that cultivates this daily thanksgiving that kills this whole self-expression that we're about all the time? What is it that will kill that in us? What will help us deny self and be a thankful people at this rich level? Well, you remember the text that I read this morning out of Hebrews 12. Turn there for a moment because this is, this is where this whole idea of thankfulness begins. In fact, I'll show you something at the end of Hebrews 12 and halfway into the 13th chapter. Notice verse 28 of Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, the writer says, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So you have a, therefore, you have have a, a command, then let us show gratitude, by which we then offer up this acceptable service with reverence and awe. And it's based upon what had come before, which we'll look at in a moment. But look at chapter 13, verse 15. The next chapter over, verse 15, through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. And don't neglect doing good and sharing for with such sacrifices God is pleased. So here you have bookends. 
The end of chapter 12, verse 28, we are told to show gratitude, offering to God this reverential and this wonderfully worshipful sacrifice of praise. And in the midway through chapter 13, you you have the same thing. Through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. So you have these bookends in between which are practical expressions of thankfulness. And before we just sort of survey them for a moment so you can sort of be challenged in your life to ask some hard questions about your own thankfulness, let's put the root system down a bit. Let's pour the foundation that's theological that drives this way of life because at the beginning of verse 28 you have this word, therefore. So clearly what comes before it is the theological root system. Now notice back in... Chapter 12, verse 15, you have a warning. Verse 15 of chapter 12, you have a warning. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. He just finished saying, pursue peace with all men and pursue the sanctification without which no one can see the Lord. Look, you ought to be pursuing holiness. You ought to be pursuing a life that is set apart unto God. Why? Because if you're saved, that's what he saved you to do. And I want you to pursue that because if you don't pursue that, there's no fruit. And if there's no fruit, you're not going to see the Lord because you're not truly a believer. Then he says, verse 15, I want you to be careful not to come short of the grace of God. How do you do that? Verse 15, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by that root of bitterness, many are defiled. Listen, we use this verse, as I said the other night when we were studying the life of Esau, we use this verse to to sort of suggest that we should not be bitter at one another, and and clearly by extension, you shouldn't be bitter at one another. That's an, an outward expression of subtle forms of unbelief. But right here, he's not talking about your treatment of one another as Christians. Here he's talking about a root of unbelief. A root of unbelief toward God that springs up and causes trouble. Because many are defiled by the unbelief that keeps you from the grace of God. Verse 16 gives an illustration. You have Esau. He's immoral and he's godless. He sells his birthright for a single meal. You say, well, my goodness, that seems like harsh punishment for the crime. He he, he was just hungry. I mean, he's just self-indulgent a little bit. No, 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 you don't understand. He despised his birthright. In despising his birthright, he wasn't grateful to God. He should have come to God and said, okay, you've asked my younger brother to be over me. You've asked me to serve my younger brother. I'll do it. Because there's blessing in your plan. There's blessing in your purposes. There's blessing in what you've given me. I don't even deserve to have breath. Just because I was born first doesn't mean you can't do with me what you choose. But he wasn't thankful. He was unbelieving, full of himself, did what he wanted, reckless. Even afterwards, verse 17, when he desired to inherit that blessing back, he just wanted the practical aspects of it for his own life. He was rejected. Why? No place for repentance. He sought that birthright back with tears. He wept for a blessing. But there was no real repentance in his his heart and in his life. There was only unbelief and ingratitude. Moses warned not to come to the place where unbelief takes over. Why? Because it's a sign of ingratitude. And then he transitions and he begins to say to them, look what you've been given. I want you to understand what you've been given. Notice the Old Testament, Old Covenant that came to God's people through the law of God. Notice verse 18. He says to these professing believers to whom he's writing, he says, you haven't come to a mountain that can be touched, strange language, but listen to it, and to a blazing fire and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind and to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words, the sound of which was such that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them. They couldn't even bear the command, even if a beast touches the mountain, it'll be stoned. So terrible was the sight that Moses, the prophet, said, I'm full of fear and trembling. 
He says, look it. If you want to cultivate gratitude in your heart and in your life, you have to understand what you've been saved from. You have to understand where you stand right now in the grace of Christ the mediator. You say, what do you mean they came to a mountain? This is Sinai. Look, when God gave his law, his law was unbending. And how did he demonstrate that you ought to fear it? You ought to fear breaking it. You ought to fear breaking it even in one thought, let alone one deed. How did he demonstrate that? He shook the earth. He had blazing fire and smoke around the mountain. There was darkness. There was gloom. There was a whirlwind. There were trumpets blazing and the sound of words hitting their ears which were otherworldly. It was terrifying. And this morning, when you woke up, and you got up and thought, you know, it's time for church, you went over and got your tea and made your coffee, went and decided what you were going to wear today, and then you came. And on your way, you might have had the thought, you know, I hope, I hope the sermon's decent today. <laughs> I hope I don't have to sit next to, you know, that other person who's always asking me hard questions. They're irritating. Man, I hope I get the parking space I want. And I hope the music is, you know, what I like. I mean, we haven't sang the songs I like in a long time. Right? You, you weren't, the earth wasn't shaking. You know, I've been in several huge earthquakes in L.A., and, and it's unsettling to say the least. In fact, your blood runs cold if it's big enough. Because everything goes dark, car alarms go off, gas lines break, and you're, it's pitch dark if it's at night. And you're flung around like a rag doll. Yeah, it wasn't going on this morning, was it? And those of you who lived in Tornado Alley, a whirlwind, I mean, 250 mile an hour in a tight circle kills people, tears the body apart. You didn't come this morning worrying about that. And what about the sound of a divine voice hitting your ears in concussive waves to the point where you're saying, stop. What was being said? The law of God, the holiness of God, the law of God. Don't break the law of God. What was the command? If even one of your cattle brushes up against the mountain, it's dead. See, an unreasoning animal who just stumbles? That's right. Don't you dare have a thought against God in this moment? Don't you have a a, a rash word against God in this moment? Don't you have a rash thought against God in this moment? Don't do it. I mean, it was terrifying. They even said to Moses, don't, don't let him talk to us directly. And Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. It was, it was unbearable. And the writer of Hebrews says, that's not how you came today. That's not how you came. Notice verse 22, you've come to Mount Zion. You've come to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, myriads of angels, the general assembly and church of the firstborn enrolled in heaven. Look at this, verse 23, and you've come to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. You don't have to sacrifice. It's not every year a reminder. You're not weighed down with the holiness of God from which you might be snuffed out in just a moment. Your family's not scared out of its wits because we're not at the base of Sinai. We're not at the old covenant. The command was too strict. They couldn't handle it. And God said, then seek me because I'm bringing one who will cover you. You seek only me. You stay faithful to me. You stay focused on me, he said. You and me today, we came to church today ready to praise God. We just came out of a wonderful time of thanksgiving. And I guarantee you that even this last week when we were rejoicing Wednesday night, thanking God in praise, the next day we had moments of sin, didn't we? 
The next day we complain, maybe even against God. Maybe this morning you come to Mount Zion and to myriads of angels and to a mediator, Jesus Christ. You even prayed when Dan said, bow your head. You bowed your head because you know you can come right to God, the judge of all, and you don't fear at all his judgment. I think about that sometimes when I think about terrorist groups around the world lopping people's head off, creating terror in cultures, blowing things up. I often think, okay, Matthew 10 says, don't fear him who can kill the body. That's nothing. Fear him whom you're going to meet when you cross that barrier. You fear him because he is the judge. He's the divine terrorist. And you will be in dread and your blood will run cold when you meet him and you don't have a mediator of a new covenant covering you with his forgiveness. We came to Jesus Christ this morning, the mediator of a new covenant. We don't fear. Because why? Because his blood is better than the old sacrifices. It was offered once. It's done. Listen, beloved, if you're not thankful or growing in your thankfulness, And you don't have a robust enough theology of what you were saved from. Or better yet, whom you were saved from. Because if we were standing at the base of Sinai, just like them, dread and terror. And just like every terrorist who blows himself up and kills people in an earthly sense, he immediately meets the divine terrorist and dread and terror fall upon him. Jesus Christ is whom we come to, completely righteous souls before God, saints, angels, heaven, Mount Zion, all the opposite. No judgment. That's who we come to. So, verse 25, see to it that you don't refuse him who's speaking. How could you refuse him? For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth... Much less will we escape who turned away from him who warns from heaven. His voice shook the earth then, but he has promised. This is Haggai 2.6. He has promised saying, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. Look, I'm coming in judgment. You even have a little exposition here by the writer, verse 27. This expression, yet once more, it signifies the removing of those things which can be shaken. Listen, when he shakes heaven and earth in the judgment, anyone who cannot stand, who has no covering of Christ, who whose sins are not forgiven, they will be shaken and they will not remain. They will go away from his presence into eternal judgment. These are things that do not have new resurrection life in them. They will have a life fashioned for judgment. And when he does shake heaven and earth, look at the end of verse 27. It's also so those things which cannot be shaken may remain. You and me will remain. That's why when a believer dies and you ask them as they're facing death, what is their hope? There's just no fear. Yeah, fear of physical pain. Who doesn't fear that? Even the Puritans who took their head and stuck it on the chopping block sometimes requested that the the stroke be singular and hard so that it didn't create some scene with half a death blow. Of course we're afraid of physical death. But not what's on the other side of that barrier. That is a one-way ticket into the presence of God who accepts those who are a part of Mount Zion. Therefore, verse 28, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, then let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. I love verse 29. Our God is a consuming fire. Hey, don't forget, he could have judged you, but he poured all that wrath out on Jesus so that you don't have that judgment. So then there's the fruit of it. I mean, this is just amazing that he bookends the rest of that section, chapter 13, verse 1, down through 
verse 16, he just sticks a bookend on those statements and says, this is what a grateful life is. This is a fruitful life. You want to cultivate thankfulness in your heart and life? You must understand that apart from Jesus Christ, apart from regeneration, apart from the gift of faith and repentance, apart from him convicting of you of your sin and granting you faith, apart from you coming to Christ in faith and repentance and being saved, you would be under the dread. No matter how much you ignore it, no matter how much you suppress it. You know, some of you here don't know the Lord and you came through last week's holiday thanking the air, thanking other human beings, maybe stirring up in the common grace of God some thankfulness for, for whatever you enjoy in life, but, but you don't understand. All of that is meaningless. It means nothing if Jesus Christ hasn't opened your heart. And you went through that Thanksgiving season and maybe many others and then you're going to meet God and if you have not understood whom you have been saved from because you've truly believed in Christ, there's not going to be any reason in the end for thankfulness at all. You're just going to dread. How sad. You say, well, how do I know, pastor? Well, here's the fruit. Here's the fruit of a saved person's life. Here's the fruit of someone who's in Christ who knows they're going to receive a kingdom that won't be shaken. Just look at it. It's just wonderful. The first thing is to love God's people. Verse 1, love the brethren. Let it continue. Thankful people love God's people. You don't like other Christians? You're selfish. You're selfish. You don't love other believers? That's pride. You don't love God's people enough to reach out to them? You're not thankful. That's unbelief. Believers are thankful people because they're believers. And believers love Thankful people love God's people. Anytime you don't love the body of Christ, it's a sin of ingratitude. You don't deserve the body of Christ. You don't deserve Christ. You don't serve the kingdom. You don't deserve any of it. You don't love the body of Christ, even with all of its warts until we meet Christ, then it's the sin of ingratitude. And look at the next one, verse 2. Unselfish living towards strangers. Loving hospitality. It just means, meeting, like I said last week, meeting the needs of others, even those that you don't know. In the body of Christ. Yeah, by extension, it means reaching out with the gospel to people on the street you don't know, yes. But here, it's a hospitality text. It, it means the love of strangers in your midst, the love of people you don't know, you're not comfortable around. That's a fruit of a thankful life. What's another fruit of a thankful life? Verse 3, compassion toward those who suffer for their faith. Remember the prisoners as though in prison with them and those who are ill-treated since you yourself are also in the body. Look, you're in a fallen body. You know what affliction's like both in disease and in persecution. You know what pain is like. There are people all over the globe that experience it. If you lack compassion in your heart, it's because you lack gratitude toward God because gratitude produces an ongoing compassion and mercy toward the afflicted, toward the less fortunate, and even the broken lives of sinful people. Even the broken lives of sinful people. I often ask myself the question, Lord, am I overwhelmed with your daily covering mercies so much so that I long for those same mercies in someone else's life? Offer up this prayer when someone sins against you. Lord, be merciful to them. I've received your mercy. Be merciful to them. Mercy triumphs over judgment, James says. God loves compassion. He loves mercy. When you believe God, you're a thankful person. When you're a thankful person, you are merciful. You grow in your compassion. 
And then this is a strange fruit of thankfulness. Verse 4, marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled. Fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. What does he mean? Look, thankfulness to God means you uphold family life, the purity of it, the sanctity of it, the strength of it, the community uh, edification of it, how it builds a community. You hate the perversion of family life. You hate the perversion of married life. Thankful people trust what God says about long-term strength. Thankful people love what he promises to those who uphold moral purity. Thankful people love God's design for the family. No wonder our society is destroying the family because it's ungrateful to God. It doesn't care about the family. It doesn't mind destroying a marriage with adultery and fornication and impurity over it. It doesn't mind destroying kids by not parenting them and neglecting them and living hypocritically in front of them. It doesn't care about destroying human lives with abortion. Ungrateful cultures continue to destroy the family in perversity. And right here, a, great, a grateful heart showing acceptable reverence and awe is one that protects the family. Grateful people protect the family. It shows gratitude to God. Do you live in purity? You're grateful. Do you secretly love impurity and run after it and never seek forgiveness for it and you never try to run away from it? You're ungrateful. Notice also, be content. Thankful people are content people. Make sure your character is free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. For he himself has said, I'll never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. How, how can you not see that as an impetus for gratefulness? So that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I won't be afraid. What will man do to me? Will you trust in the things of this earth? It's ingratitude. Will you sin to get material things? Will you sin to hoard them? Do you secretly relish power and influence? The thought came to mind. I was telling the first service. I just, I, I, I grieve when someone who knows the gospel and grew up in gospel heritage coming up in the world wants to be famous in the world's eyes. I just, it just boggles my mind. Why would you want to gain power and influence in the world? It's ingratitude. Clearly, you're not content. You're not content. You have to have power and influence because you have the lure of praise and power and resources and wealth and all those things you should never trust. Here he says here, the Lord is your helper. Don't be afraid. What is man? What is economy? What are these things going to do to you? The Lord won't desert you. This is a fruit of thankfulness. And notice verse 7. Emulate the character of, of mentors in your life. Verse 7. Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. What was, what was Christ-like in them? You imitate so that it's Christ-like in you. Emulate their character. It's a sign of gratitude. Got a discipler in your life? And you chafe at the council? It's ingratitude. You got a pastor in your life who keeps probing that area you don't want probed, it's ingratitude. You have a mentor in your life who keeps handing you that book and challenging you to read it and you, you keep laying it by the bedside and it collects dust, it's ingratitude. You spurn the counsel of your parents, it's ingratitude. Grateful hearts emulate the character, the Christ-likeness and Christ-like counsel of faithful leaders. They speak the word of God to you. You should remember that. Consider it. Imitate it. It's grateful. You don't deserve mentors in your life. Did you know that? God doesn't have to give you mentors, someone to come alongside you. I mean, blind spots. Anybody here without any blind spots? You say, I don't know. I'm blind to them. It's true. (laughs) But we know we have them. I know there are gaps in my theology. There's gaps in my character. 
Somehow God's going to have to show those to me, like Paul says in Philippians 3.17. If you have an area in your life needs to change, the Lord will reveal that to you also. I'm praying he'll reveal it, but it's something I can't see. And you know what? He doesn't have to reveal it. I could go waltzing myself into trouble if he wants. And I keep praying, Lord, protect me from that. You know how he does it? He sends somebody in your life you don't like. Somebody that may not like you, but somebody that may love you. You don't know. Certainly someone that's an instrument of grace in your life and you chafe at it. It's ingratitude. You don't have a you don't have a right to have things the way you want. You don't have the right to have your blind spots revealed. You could stumble and bumble along. It's a grace from the Lord to have somebody say to you, Hey, I want to help you with something in your life. See, gratitude. It covers so much ground. Ingratitude weaves its way into so many insidious areas. Notice, stay away from self-righteousness. Don't be carried away, verse 9, by varied and strange teachings. It's good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by these rituals of foods through which those who were so occupied weren't benefited Look, we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. Look, you got all those people wrapped up in works and rituals, self-atonement. Get away from that stuff. It's ingratitude. Why would you want to perform for God when he's done it all? How ungrateful can you be performing for God's love? How ungrateful can you be focusing only on the externals rather than on your heart? Salvation is by grace through faith. So walk by faith. Don't pretend. Don't be involved in rituals by which you make yourself righteous. Self, self-righteousness, self-atonement, performing for God, it's ingratitude. We live by grace, through faith. Stay away from self-righteousness. You know what that means? That means bearing Christ's reproach. Notice, He says there, the bodies of those animals you used to sacrifice whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might set apart the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. So let's go out to him outside the camp bearing his reproach. You stay away from all those other self-righteous tendencies and you follow Christ. He was your sacrifice. You bow to him. You obey him. What he commands, you listen to. Why? It's an expression of gratefulness. People say all the time, oh, what should motivate us to obey? Look, it's a thousand and one things. But it has to be the worthiness of Christ, does it not? I mean, you could wrap up every motivation for obedience into that one thing. Our mediator is worthy. And the only way you can see if you know that is the grateful following of his commands. Humble, grateful obedience. I don't care whether I feel like it or not. I don't care whether I am at the height of emotional joy or not. He's worthy. And if he's worthy and I'm grateful... Obedience will be there. It'll be there. It won't be there easily because my flesh hates it so. But he's empowered me past my flesh. It'll be there. To turn inward and make it something about me, to turn inward and make it something about anything other than Christ or his worthiness is foolish. To make it anything about affections and emotions and all that stuff is to contrive obedience. To make it about externals and performance is to contrive obedience. He's worthy. Thankfulness obeys and bears his reproach, whatever, because he's worthy. And so notice, verse 15, through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, the fruit of lips that give thanks to him. Don't neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. I love him throwing verse 17 in there, though. I know you don't like it. Obey your leaders and submit to them. (laughs) By the way, there's nothing in that verse about personal authority of one human being over another. It's just delegated authority. We are your servants, the leaders in your midst, the disciples in your life, the pastors in your life. 
in the church, they, are, they have a delegated authority to speak the truth, and you should obey that authority and submit to it, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Look at this. Let them do it with joy, not with grief. This isn't profitable for you. Be thankful in it. Be grateful in it. And the last expression of thankfulness, pray for a clean conscience. Verse 8, pray for us, for we're sure that we have a good conscience, desiring to conduct ourselves honorably in all things. And I urge you all the more to do this, so that I may be restored to you the sooner. Look, I, I'm working on a clean conscience. I'm praying that I'm able to do all things honorably. You pray for that same thing. You pray for me. I pray for you. And you pray for a clean conscience and honorable behavior. And the Lord's purposes be done. So, so then all of that you could pack into the words of the Apostle Paul, Colossians 3, 16 and 17. Let the words of Christ richly dwell in your midst, in your own heart and in your midst as a body. And you're singing and praising God with thankfulness in your heart to one another. And therefore in everything, in word or deed, Do it all in the name of the Lord. You say, word and deed, where's the motive? Right there. In everything, in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. There it is. There's the internal life. That's why you do it. There's the motive. It's in his name. It's for his glory. It's to him. It's unto him. It's about his worthiness. It's unto his exaltation. And you do it giving thanks through Jesus Christ to God the Father. There it is, in everything. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do it all in the name of Jesus Christ, giving thanks to him and through him to God the Father. That's that's what you practice. That's what you cultivate. It has a rich theological base, the wrath of God from which you've been saved, a judge of all the universe, from whom we've been saved. He must judge. He's not an ogre. He is the most remarkable, out, just astonishing God that could have ever revealed himself to his creation. It's absolutely unfathomable and unsearchable that though he should judge and could judge and must judge all that is against his holiness, he bore his own wrath to save us from it. Therefore, show gratitude in these ways. You want to die to self? There's how you do it, beloved. There's how you do it. You show gratitude in these ways. The last two next time. Let's pray. Lord, you have been to your people a ministry of kindness such that we cannot measure. And Lord, we pray your mercy upon our weakness. How often we have not honored you. We've not had a clean conscience and a pure heart and honored you the way you deserve to be honored. We've grumbled, complained, been unthankful. Even today, while singing your praises, There have been in our hearts at times less than your honor. And so we know you accept our meager worship in your son, Jesus Christ. And we know that we're covered in his righteousness so that you you cannot love us any more than you love us because we are in your son whom you love perfectly and eternally. And the fact that we come to Zion and to myriads of angels and the spirits of righteous made perfect. And we come to you, O God, right into your presence, the judge of all. And we come to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn. We come to heaven, the new Jerusalem. We are on our way into the eternal glories. Then therefore we should be the most grateful people on earth. 
Help us live the fruit of it. We confess that we don't always, but we long to emulate our Savior all the more. Please forgive our ingratitude in all these ways. And may we offer to you even today a new and fresh passion and conviction for your worthiness that we might gratefully honor you. We pray this for your glory's sake. Amen. Please stand if you would. How we doing? You doing okay in this series?